Hey, in this episode, we're talking to Jim Coffey from the DNR for the state of Iowa, Mr. Turkey. So we're going to be talking turkey survey. Stay with us. Hi, this is Tim and Dole. Welcome to Midwest Hunting and Outdoors by Two Dumbasses, a podcast about the outdoors, hunting, and being a steward of the land. Welcome to Midwest Hunting and Outdoors by Two Dumbasses. Today we're at the Sheridan Research Facility at the Red Haw State Park in Iowa. to talk about uh, the turkey survey that just came out. Mr. Turkey, I'm here. Well, right? I, am. I so. don't want to go that far. <laughs> and Jim, it's, it's been, we were talking on the trip here, it's been almost a couple years since we were here. Um, we'll put that previous episode on kind of turkey habitat is mm-hmm. what we met with you the first time. Mm-hmm. And we dug deep and we even got into armadillos, if I remember what we were talking <laughs> yeah. about. So. Yeah. How is the armadillo uh, population yeah, well, in Iowa? I guess I would say steady to increasing. We, we, we get about 12 to 15 reports still every year, um, but from all over the state. So it's nothing that we can really say it's in one area or not, but, but we still get plenty of reports. Are these survivors or not survivors? A little bit of both. Um, so we will actually get a few this time of the year from shed hunters that will find them that have, that have died. Really? And so they usually find the carcass while they're out shed hunting. Um, but I just had my first report, I think like the 15th of January of a live armadillo running around. So we've had a fairly mild winter in some parts of the state, so they can survive, but if it gets too cold, they're probably not going to make it. Um, yeah. Well, that's my fault. <laughs> I'm armadillo <laughs> off topic already. We're, we're really here to talk about turkeys. I mean, this is, this, this episode is going to get released, um, you know, just weeks ahead of the, uh, uh spring turkey hunting season in Iowa anyway so good timing on this episode but uh, this is all about the survey right Jim and so talk to us about what the DNR wild turkey survey consists of and how's it done absolutely so it's a it's a citizen science based survey um, that has evolved over the years and originally we called it our, our rural mail carrier survey so we would send postcards out to our rural mail carriers um, usually for a couple months, which is June and July, um, kind of after the breeding season stopped and the, the poults have grown up big enough you can see them. And these were people that drove consistently the same routes every day, and we would ask them just to record what they saw. Um, and through time, that's kind of evolved that that went away. And so we were looking at another way to cover as much space as we could across the state that our employees can't cover. Um, so we turned to this citizen science space survey. And of course, now with apps, you can do it right on your phone. And so in the month of June, or excuse me, July and August, we'll make the app um, active, and or the, the website active, and people that see their turkeys can report them. Um, the one thing that we do ask is that if you see turkeys consistently in the same spot, you only report them one time, so that it doesn't bias the data. So if you know that there's, when you turn the corner, there's gonna be turkeys in your food plot every morning, you only count them once. <laughs> That website location you want to throw yeah, that well, out? Yeah, it'll be on our DNR webpage underneath turkeys, and there'll be a there'll be a hot link that you can just click on that um, and say you have a turkey to report. And we'll include that uh, yeah. in the episode here, um, so people know. That'd can be great. Bookmark it and whatnot. Yeah, and so. it's open to anybody. We have a select group of people that we do send a postcard out to every year to remind them about the survey, but it's open to anybody that, that sees turkey. So you don't have to be one of those people. Um, that gets a postcard. And you, and you mentioned uh, website, but is it is it part of the DNR uh, go out? I think it's Go Outdoors uh, DNR. So it's not listed through the Go Outdoors app. Okay. No, it would be on our iowadnr.gov website. Got it. So the Outdoors app is a way for you to kind of the portal for you to buy your licenses and check on your registrations and harvest and stuff. But this would be actually on our, our DNR webpage. And I think last year we threw the link, once it became active, we threw it on a couple of our episodes so that people could get that. So um, 
stay tuned there. We'll keep an eye out for that and we'll yeah. throw that back. I'm still evolving when it comes to apps and computers and things like that. So I'm being drugged <laughs> into the 22nd century. But, well, here's here's the summary of it. There's an app for everything. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. And probably more than one. Yeah. So uh, trail camera. How do trail camera pictures fit into this? Yeah. So um, we don't use trail cameras specifically uh, because of the, the, the size of the scope of the survey. But obviously, if somebody wants to look at turkeys on their property, it would be a great way to look at that, um, especially when you're when you're actively placing those on brooding areas, so you can look at hens with poults to see how your production was through the summer. Because once that hen is established, she's not going to move a great distance um, in that fall time. Now, once those poults get large enough, they may move to a wintering site, and then come about now, March 15th or so, then they'll redisperse across the landscape. But it would be okay for me filling out the survey if I had trail camera pictures, yeah. as long as I don't duplicate. Right, yeah. So the hard part there is your trail camera's normally not moving too much. So once you report a hen with a brood, you probably want to say, okay, I've reported that hen with that brood. What? Unless you can differentiate that it's it's a different one, or you move your cameras to a different creeping plot or something like that. Excellent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. A lot of this is designed for people that are just out doing their daily activities, and they see, see birds. Um, and then we'll split the July and the August up. We'll combine them as well. Um, because turkeys will tend to have two to three nests a year, uh, nesting attempts per year. And so you'll have some early hatch birds and you'll have some late hatch birds. And so those early hatch birds might be too small to catch in the survey, but by August they'll be big enough to see. And the birds born in June will be big enough by August to be seen. So I uh, just learned something there. I well, did not. You're, you're saying that. So I got to be careful what I said. Yeah. Is they'll have attempts. Attempt. So a hen will attempt, if her nest is destroyed, she'll attempt again. But once she has a successful brood, um, she's done for the year. Got she'll it. have one, one brood. But I have seen significant different sizes in the poults yeah. when, when I'm out there, especially this year it seemed like. Yeah, and this is one of those interesting years. So there's, there's really not to get too far in the weeds, but there's really kind of four scenarios for turkey production. Um, and what we really hope for is good early nesting incubation and get those birds off early and then they tend to grow fast and through the summer. But you got those birds that will try and clear into August and September, and so those poults are still viable. They're just gonna be pretty small going into the winter time. Um, and that's not a big big number of birds. Most of those birds are born in that first or second uh, nesting attempt. I would guess those ones born a little later are the sacrificed uh, ones for the greater good. They, they do all right, they do all right, and it really, it's depending on the winter time, how significant it is, because you gotta remember they're growing. And the big component of pulp growth is insects. So as long as insects are available, that really gets them up and going fast. But when you get to the winter time, so you're already behind the, the eight ball and now your insects have died off, so now you've got to switch to grains and, and other things. So you're gonna enter that, that winter a little smaller and maybe not be as successful as everybody else. Yeah. Now, not to not to digress too much. We talked earlier and you know, what planted. We, we've yeah. already digressed the armadillos. We can't go. <laughs> Those no apology needed. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I planted a bunch of buckwheat, and they, they really love that buckwheat. I mean, it must be all the insects, right? I mean, all the insects with the flower. Yeah, so anything that's, that's a forb, that's a flower, that, that creates pollinators to come in, insects. And so the small grains is a great benefit of the buckwheat when it does mature. But anything that's producing that flower that needs pollinated, that's going to draw insects in, is going to bring your turkeys in. Cause, and, and a lot of other birds, because a lot of other birds are doing the same thing. They're wanting to get those young birds on insects to grow fast. So, yeah, great stuff. Yeah, that, that buckwheat is prolific. It's, uh, <laughs> and it's uh, the right price, right? Yeah. So, yeah, it's good. Sounds like another podcast. <laughs> that's what it does. Uh, hey, let's talk about results of the, this year's po uh, podcast, this yeah. year's uh, survey. survey. Yeah, yeah, tricky yeah. Survey. So, so we look at it in a couple ways. We, we tend to look at it statewide, um, and that gives us the most uh, statistically significant um, standard deviations. And we had good harvest, or good, excuse me, good um, production this year. But then we also break the state down into nine agricultural regions, which are about 15 counties each. Uh, and that allows us to look at a scale um, of that region a little bit better. But we can't go down to the county level because we just don't get enough reports to be able to say with any confidence that that's what's happening. So when we look at the nine agricultural regions, north to south, east to west, that kind of gives us a pretty good idea of what's happening. And, and we know this year seven of the nine were above the five-year average. 
Um, this year, south, uh, Southwest and, and West Central were the two low spots uh, of the state. And that's not surprising because when I talked to my counterparts in, counterparts in Kansas and Nebraska, they saw some lower production this year as well. And that can be a result of drought. That can be a result of a lot of things. Um, so it doesn't surprise me that that side of the state saw something that was similar to those states over there as well. But this is a little bit of a, um, a twist or a, a trend breaker, if you would, of previous years, right? Turkey, turkey survey numbers and, sur <laughs> and turkey, turkey populations have been, been plummeting a little bit? Well, so great question. Okay. Plummeting is not the word I would use. That's probably a bad choice. <laughs> I would declining. Say declining. Declining over, yeah, a, yeah. over a long term. So probably not something that we notice year to year to year, but if you look back 10 to 15 years, especially if you've been out hunting that long, you would have noticed a decline. Now, the nice thing is, is we've been on a three year above average production and turkeys really have a pretty high turnover rate. So an old turkey would not be much older than four or five years. So in three years, you can see your turkey population start to rebound pretty quickly. When you get three back-to-back -back years, it's compounding. So we should see some pretty good turkey numbers this year. Uh, most turkey hunters love two-year-old gobblers because they like to gobble. They're teenagers. They like to gobble. They like to move. And they're done. So, <laughs> it's a great combination for a hunter. So right? hunters <laughs> like two-year-old turkeys. So, so we really have to look at not this year's production, but last year's production because those will be this year's two-year-old gobblers. And it was good last year. So we should see decent number of harvesting in this year. You're a brave man making those predictions right here on video. I didn't so. put anything down in paper. I didn't <laughs> put a number down. I said it ought to be as good as normal. That's good though. Well, I mean, we've been, uh, you know, yeah. we were, I know there's been, I read, read in magazines yeah. a lot of concern about the trend um, last year. And even when we talked again mm -hmm. in our last visit yeah. that, uh, you know, that it was, that no one really had a good, Good. There's Please. not a good. There's not a good silver bullet, and and so the kind of the common term that's being talked about amongst most turkey biologists is death by a thousand cuts. It's lack of this, lack of that, this changing, that changing, everything just being against the bird, and so it's just kind of tapering itself down to what we're calling the new normal. Is the landscape changed? The way we deal with the land has changed. Other things have changed, and so this might be the new normal. It might not be the 1980s. Well, I tell you what, Joel's, so we have a little hunting contest between our, you know, would it better be deer or turkey? And his wife's won what, four years in a row? Four years in a row. Four years in a row. And her, and her birds, I'm not kidding you, are like 25 to 28 pounds. Yeah. I mean, every single one. And so that's what the country loves about Iowa is, I don't know how old you guys are, but you're probably a little younger than me. And Iowa used to be known as the land of big gobblers. And it was not uncommon to have 30 pound gobblers shot in the springtime. Um, in fact, that was kind of that threshold of wow, he shot a 28, 30 pound gobbler. But 25 to 26, it's right in there. That's the mix of where they should be is a nice, healthy, healthy bird. Now the other side of that is that that adult gobbler that's kind of the harem leader, sometimes he's not real big because like big buck deer, is he doesn't want to spend any time feeding in the springtime. He's got one thing on his mind, and food is not it. So his weight will actually decrease during that breeding season. So sometimes if you shoot that bird that's only in that 19-pound range or less, it's, it's a nice, healthy gobbler, he might be your dominant bird. That's what's been happening is I'm shooting the viral birds. Right. You shooting are, shooting are purposely birds. targeting the more <laughs> 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 dominant <laughs> birds. <laughs> That's exactly it. Yeah. Any excuse it takes, right? Yeah. yeah. I picked out the biggest bird. The old bird. So those are the results. Any? Yeah. Is there any talk of what um, you know? What's causing some of that? Can you, if you put any puzzles together? Well, so in reality, again, Iowa is very variable from north to south, east to west, and so we really can't say it's one thing in Iowa. We did an LPDV study a couple years ago, so lymphoid mm -hmm. proliferative disease virus. And we asked turkey hunters to submit a leg um, from their harvested birds, and so then we could check that DNA, um, or excuse me, check that bone marrow for presence of the virus. We were hoping we wouldn't find it at all, and then if we did find it, we wanted to find it in one of those areas where turkeys were declining, so we could say, aha, we didn't. We found it pretty much across the state, and we found it in some of our better counties that have good turkey numbers, so we don't know what that means. But the interesting part is it's a fairly new disease on the landscape 
Um, and it's a, it's a disease that was found in domestic poultry. And so there's been some domestic work that shows that it does suppress uh, egg laying and survival. And so we're co still concerned about that. That's one issue. Then there's a hundred other issues that go along with it. Yeah, I think I submitted two legs for that. Did you? I know. I think I know you did. So that will be on the web. Those results will be on the website soon too. <laughs> I'm a little more behind. So that well, was actually an Iowa State study. I, I know one change that I'm hoping is going to have a big positive impact. You know where I'm going with this, Tim. Is is the raccoon seasons opened up all year round, right? So. Hopefully that would help. Well, I think it's in the process. It hasn't opened up yet, but the okay. rules are looking at changing. Okay. Um, I, I hate to burst your bubble. Oh, it probably won't help a lot. It'll make me feel a lot gonna better. I'll guarantee you. It'll it's going to make people feel, feel a lot better. Mm -hmm. And so where I don't want to discourage you is that, yes, you may have an impact on your farm. If you get out and actively trap more <laughs> coons than you have in the past, you may have a chance to impact your farm. But I tend to look at things on a statewide basis, and we probably won't harvest enough raccoons on a statewide basis to really make a difference. That makes sense. Yeah. The other, the other pessimistic side of me is, is that what we know about predators is that when you remove one predator, another predator fills the gap. So I, I, I just I want to preface, I don't want people to think this is the silver bullet. If I kill more raccoons, I'm going to get more turkeys. It's just going to make me feel better that I'm reducing some raccoon numbers, and then I'll wait to see what happens. Sure. Does that make sure? No, it doesn't make me okay. feel better, Sorry. but so I do have it's not going to change my approach either. So I do have another digression, mm -hmm. right? So we did a certain, we talked with, uh, I can't remember the gentleman's name on pheasant. Todd Bogan shoots? Yeah, Probably. we talked to Todd. We did a, we did a, uh, an episode with Todd. Mm -hmm. And during that conversation, you know, we were talking about, hey, what's the habitat area for a pheasant? It's like, and he said, he goes, Hey, if they're not really pushed off, mm -hmm. if, if I remember correctly, it's like 120 acres. Mm -hmm. He said they'll stick around roughly 120 acres. Yeah. What is that for turkey? So it's very seasonal. Um, and typically, if you're, I, I put it in, in human terms. If, if, uh, if my recliner's over here and my refrigerator's on the other side of town, I got a long walk to go. But if my bed and my recliner and my food are all kind of in the same spot, I don't have to move as much. So if you're providing the seasonal attributes that that turkey needs, they're going to be probably on less than a square mile, 640 acres. It depends. It depends. That's the biological answer. It depends. But if you're only providing the mature timber, that bird's going to move to a wintering spot. That bird's going to breed here and want to move its poults to a, to a brooding area. And there's death in movement. The more a turkey has to move, the greater chance it's going to run into something that's going to make a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So what we tend to like for turkeys right. is kind of that southern Iowa mixture of pasture and crop and a little bit of timber and a little bit of southern Iowa crud that's not really managed. And between those four types of habitat, we tend to have really good turkey numbers. So one of the things we probably have too much of, and I hate to say this in Iowa, is too much mature timber is our timber is overstocked, meaning there's too much timber out there, and the timber we have is getting too old. So we need to get some more shrub component back, some more grass component back. And so where we see numbers going up is in North Central Iowa, <coughs> which is typically oak savanna type habitats. So again, big trees, but lots of grass, lots of shrubs, lots of the transitional, transitional things. So, I mean, that's where you see turkeys typically, right? This is either open fields or open or air, open air areas. Well, they, for bugging, they like yeah. to One of the biggest things, if you guys have ever done a spring burn, I hope you've done some burning. Yep. Look at the amount of anthills after you do a burn, the amount of anthills that are out in, a, in your CRP field. So ants are out as soon as it warms up and turkeys love to eat ants. Lots of stuff mm -hmm. love to eat ants, but then those spiders are out there. So they're moving out to those areas to bug and to eat and to do things. But they're moving in your mature timber because they have to roost. They eat the acorn crop that falls. They're doing lots of scratching for snails and other things, which is where they get their calcium from. So there's a reason to be in that timber. So they wow. need that mixture that goes through things. And I would say, you know, what you described is probably how we've been migrating our farm. And this last year is probably the best I've seen turkeys. We had good production. And I'm glad to hear that because that's what I like to hear because that confirms our survey. When I talk to people and they say, man, I saw turkeys this year, I'm like, yeah, because that's what we saw in our survey. So it means they're correlating well together. Yeah. And when you talk about your farm, again, 640 acres, there's not a lot of guys that have 640 acres. So you kind of got to look at your neighbor's farms and what they're producing or what they're supplying to those turkeys as well. Um, because you might have the timber or more timber and they might have the 
the creek yeah, bottom yeah. land and the pasture and that stuff. But that's that whole turkey's life cycle there. Yeah, fun. Yeah. Things well, to think about. Make your head think. Well, you heard it here first, folks. Prediction from uh, <laughs> Mr. Turkey saying uh, Iowa turkey season is going to be gangbusters this year. I didn't say gangbusters. Well, I said it. Maybe I made that. Let's go back order. to the tape and see what the word is. Should be promising. Yeah. Tim, any final questions? No, I, I just, I mean, we could sit here and talk all day. Uh, it would be fun to. It would be fun. And uh, we might have to have a cerveza or something there to help with that. But, uh, no, I don't have anything. This has been fun. And I learned something every time we come out here. Jim, is there any topic or anything that we missed, um, you know, that we could have talked from a survey standpoint or turkey standpoint? So a survey standpoint, what we're really going to ask people to do is to learn turkeys. And I'm hoping to get a little bit of better information up on our website is to learn that male from that female. And as those poults grow, they get to be a little blended in with the females. So when you in that survey, we ask you, did you see turkeys? Could you identify them? And then which age group were they, adults or, or juveniles? And that really makes those statistics on the survey much more usable. And I'm assuming that that teaching tools are out there on the they are. website. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, Indiana's got the best one because they actually give you a quiz. That you oh, can look at wow. it, you can look at the pictures, and you can say this is what these are. So we, we kind of send you to their website a little bit on our website. I'm sure there's a joke in there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But so, yeah, just, just become familiar with what you're looking at and then, you know, feel confident to report it. And then we'll do the best we can with the data you send us. Jim, what are you going to do to the rest So as soon as we're done here today, I'm going to go sit on some turkey nest sites um, where we're trying to catch some wild turkeys with a goal to look at some of the issues that we've talked about here is what is those thousand cuts. Um, and so we have a goal of putting a hundred hens uh, with radio marked uh, transmitters on them out before nesting season starts. And then we'll be looking at the demographics is how many of those hens are attempting to nest, how many of them are successful nesting. After they're successful nesting, we'll go in and find the eggs. We'll count how many eggs there were to see what their production was. And then typically we go out two weeks after they hatch and we'll flush those birds to see how many of those poults are still alive. And that gives us a general idea of what each hen is producing that we can extrapolate from. Oh, that's awesome. Wow. Yeah, that's fun. The beauty is the technology, because when I did this years and years ago, we had to listen to little radio beeps all day. And now it's all GPS. So we're getting up to 96 locations a day from a hen. So we can see where she's nesting at, where she's taking her brood to, what kind of habitat she's moving through. So we're getting much better information through technology than we did 30 years ago. And that's what's exciting. It's amazing. It's probably way more inexpensive than the older technology. It, it, the personnel is the expensive part. So we have a lot invested in sitting on bait sites, capturing birds, handling birds. Um, but the cost per point is much cheaper than it used to be. What great data, huh? It, it's unbelievable. Amazing. I wish I had it 30 years ago. I could be answering some of your questions. Now. <laughs> so now those transmitters, how long do they... How long do they last? Again, great technology. So old battery transmitters, two or three years. Um, some of the new GPS stuff, less than one year. Depends on how many data points you're uploading. But this year, we've gone to a solar-powered transmitter that will probably outlast and outlive the turkey the itself. Turkey. So we have the potential to catch a turkey that was born in the spring. It'll be a juvenile this fall, and we can follow her through her entire life with the transmitter. How big, uh, how, how big, how big are those? How big? Um, they're about... They're probably about three inches by an inch. They only weigh about um, 60 to 80 grams. They're really lightweight. They get a, attached on a, with a, basically a backpack, like a kid's little backpack on their wings, and it doesn't bother them a bit. No yeah. kidding. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And then each bird will get a leg band, too. And if we catch males, we're not putting radio transfers on males, but we'll leg band them, too. So if anybody happens to harvest a bird with a leg band on it, we ask them to report it back to us. Sure. So we can look at that male data as well. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. I'm assuming that's going on. You, you want to get a, a, a good data state across the whole state. Yeah, so we really started out looking at southeast Iowa because that's where most of our complaints were coming about the downward trends. And we've been seeing that downward trend for 10 to 15 years. So that's what we're really focusing on. So we'll be catching basically birds from um, Interstate 35 clear to the Mississippi River and looking through that southeast region south of Interstate 80 or with a goal of 100 hens uh, throughout that, that area. Um, so we can kind of, one, target what's happening with birds, but two, can we regionalize it as well and see if there's something down there that's a little bit different. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that that's purposeful work. 
right there. That would be fun and purposeful work. Uh, we, yeah. hope, we hope it makes turkeys in between the long there. sets, waiting for the turkeys, <laughs> right? But, uh, well, luckily, cool. I can still answer emails. <laughs> so. Funny, yeah. funny. Is there any other hot topics, uh, Jim, that we... There's always hot topics with the DNR, especially right now. You know, when this when, by the time this probably gets aired, the legislative season will be over, and there'll be some better answers of what happened during that. Um, but I just always remind people that, that wildlife is dynamic. It's moving. It will never be the same. And, and what we try to do is monitor it and, and manage out the peaks and the valleys and try to keep it as steady as we can. And we do it for the wildlife, and we do it for the people of Iowa. Because if you're not out there enjoying it, what are we doing it for? That's right. And so yeah, we need people to be out there enjoying Iowa's wildlife. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, I want to thank you for absolutely. Let us take time. Your time. Awesome. What a pleasure. Yeah. But till next time, folks. Be, be safe, safe. Have, have fun, and get yeah. outdoors. Thanks for listening or watching our show. We have some exciting topics and guests coming up. We ask that you subscribe to our channel on YouTube and follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. We look forward to hearing your suggestions for topics, questions, and comments. This is Two Dumbasses signing off. Until next time, be, be safe, safe, have, have fun, fun, and, and get, get outdoors. outdoors.